Good evening. It's lovely to be here with you in front of a gorgeous, roaring fire, which to me seems a symbol of friendship like no other. Many a friendship is forged by a campfire of a night when you're a young child, bonding with friends and cooking sausages over a fire, or indeed when you're older, sitting around a fire with a glass of wine, and perhaps when you're very old, sitting and smoking a pipe by the fire. I wonder if anyone does that these days. Anyway, I thought a fire was a great symbol of friendship, and here I am tonight broadcasting to you from my dad's house in Suffolk, which is why I have a slightly different background to my normal books. Um, and I might be doing a little bit of adjusting because I haven't quite got my angles right. Anyway, lovely to see you all. And I'm very happy to be sharing the theme of friendship in literature with you this evening. But before we start looking at books with um, important and great literary friendship, which is what we'll be doing, I'm just going to give you um, a little bit of info about a fantastic salon that you could go to and you can still get tickets, which is this Friday night in Brighton. You can go to a real live literary salon with Damien Barr and Douglas Stewart, who is the Booker Prize winner of 2021, um, who wrote the amazing novel Shuggy Bane, and he's got his new book out, Young Mungo, which is equally brilliant, and I've just had the joy of reading that, and it is fabulous, and he'll be in conversation with Damien on Friday night at a wonderful venue in Brighton called the Ironworks, which is very close to the station. It's a fabulous new venue, so you can still get tickets for that on um, Damien Bar, I think it's Damien Bar Lit Salon. Co. Uk. Anyway, easy to find if you Google and do book those tickets if you can. And there's also some tickets for another fabulous literary salon on the fifth of May. Um, so have a look at that too. So I'm going to be talking tonight about great friends in literature, and I'd like to start with a quote from Hamlet. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel. That's Polonius talking to Hamlet um, right at the beginning of the play in Act One, scene three. Polonius is actually, sorry, not talking to Hamlet, he's bidding Laertes, his son, a farewell and telling him to grapple his friends to him with hoops of steel. And that is actually something which I very much took to heart when I first heard that expression so beautifully put and I always have endeavoured to grapple my friends to me with hoops of steel and I really thought about this theme in literature this evening because people so often when they think of fiction and novels tend to think first of romances and of love stories and how those are what tend to be the major plot of a novel. But friendships can be just as important in novels as romances, if not more so. And indeed, in life, your friendships can be just as much a definition of who you are as the people that you fall in love with and indeed live with. And on a personal note, I'd just like to point out that I... Uh, made a fantastic friend at Cambridge when I was only 18 and I ended up writing a book with her, The Novel Cure, and then another book, The Story Cure. That was Susan Elderkin and the fact that I met her at such a formative age and that we got on like a house on fire and decided that it was a great idea to think about bibliotherapy and what that could mean meant that we eventually wrote these two books together and that was a wonderful moment in our friendship which took us over about four years and so that's just how 
profound and amazing friendship can be. It can completely change the course of your life. And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening in the many wonderful examples that we have in fiction of great friendships. I'm sorry I keep adjusting my screen. I'm trying to reveal the fabulous fire to the Facebook viewers. Um, I think you can see it quite well on Instagram and thank you for appreciating it um, because it is really gorgeous. I'm just going to have to give the Facebook viewers the odd little moment to appreciate it with the screen because I can't quite make it work. Sorry about that. Um, so when I started researching this topic of friendship in literature, um, obviously lots of books immediately came to mind, but I started Googling around and I came across a really fantastic book that has only just been written and published, Great Literary Friendships by Janet Phillips. And look how beautiful it is. It is indeed a gorgeous thing. And I would very much recommend any of you getting this book if you're interested in the topic. And I think Janet Phillips, who wrote the book, has made a really wonderful collection of literary friendships, which are divided into chapters very cleverly, where she has um, childhood, students and apprentices, um, heart to heart, which is all about female friendships, buckering and bon ami, that's Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, adventure, she has the loneliest in the world, that's George and Lenny from Of Mice and Men, and hard times, and indeed, for better and for worse, which is Elena and Lena from My Brilliant Friend um, and the other books in that series by Elena Ferrante. So this is a very beautifully compiled and created book, which very much chimes with all the topics that I'm talking about this evening. And I'm going to read you a bit from the introduction to the book, because I think Janet Phillips, the author, has described literary friendships in a very beautiful and inspiring way, which I'm just going to share with you now. During the coronavirus pandemic, which took hold in 2020, most of us, under various lockdown restrictions, were not able to meet our friends for several months. And during this time, many of us turned to books, in particular, the classics for solace. This should really come as no surprise, since throughout these much loved and perennially popular works of fiction, close friendships abound. These are the most intimate best friends of childhood, student days, romance, hard times, or even a lifetime. They're entirely different from the social media networks of the 21st century. Often it is just one companion who supports the hero or heroine on their journey, through life's troubles and triumphs. I'll come with you, or variations to this effect, was the line which first inspired me to think about the role of friends in our favourite books. For me, it captures the essence of friendship in times of overwhelming difficulties. It acknowledges that a friend can't solve things, can't always even give advice, but they can be present and that in itself is invaluable. In various ways, Celia says it to Rosalind, when she is suddenly evicted from her home. Sam says it to Frodo as he sets out for Mordor and what seems like certain death. Hermione says it to Harry on many occasions when all other arguments have failed. Tom says it to Huck when he reveals his fateful plan to hide out in a graveyard. Ratty says it to Mole when he's overcome by homesickness for his beloved burrow. Further back in time, Pylades, defenceless against the gods, nevertheless accompanies his friend Orestes on his terrible journey of vengeance. And in the book of Ruth, Ruth insists on going with her mother-in-law Naomi to Bethlehem, whatever fate awaits her there. Such valued companionship extends, of course, to happier times and other life-changing events, including lending an ear when the hero or heroine has fallen in love. Many writers across the ages have had fun with this theme, creating long-suffering friends to become 
valued confidants and comforters. Pandarus takes on this role in Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade. Juliet's nurse and cousin Celia are among several examples in Shakespeare. On the darker side of romance, several friendships are tested to the limit when both fall in love with the same person. Jane Austen's Emma grapples with this unhappy situation, as do Maggie and Lucy in The Mill on the Floss and Lena and Elena in Ferrante's Neapolitan novels. Once the seduction is over, however, it has to be said that literary friendships often falter in the face of marriage. Who hasn't lost a friend when an old friend has ended up with a partner that they haven't particularly loved? I mean, that the friend doesn't love. Arthur Conan Doyle rashly has Watson proposed to Mary Morstan in The Sign of Four and then spills much ink, finding excuses for her absence until he eventually kills her off in time for Holmes's return. Indeed, several of the duos in this book are the happy bachelors of Victorian and Edwardian times. Pip and Herbert, Mole and Ratty, able to have so much more fun than their female counterparts. Anne of Green Gables fears her friendship with Diana will end on the day of Diana's wedding. And it's true that their intense relationship recedes in the later books. In pre-20th century literature, it can be more difficult to find central female friendships that don't revolve around finding a husband. And male writers of previous centuries tend to see young unmarried women as rivals for male affection. Brilliant though it is, Oscar Wilde's witty portrayal of Gwendolyn and Cecily, who, due to Algernon's deception, believe themselves engaged to the same man in the importance of being earnest, nevertheless has its roots in this assumption. Jack says, Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that you like, that half an hour after they met, they'll be calling each other sister. Algernon says, women only do that when they've called each other a lot of other things first. Ha, ha, ha. But in the 20th century, writers such as Alice Walker, Damien, I know that she's a big favourite of yours, Toni Morrison and Margaret Atwood embraced the role of the female friend, flawed, controversial, unreliable even, but ultimately free from patriarchal control. And like her all over, Bridget Jones ushered in a whole new genre of writing on young women and their pals, which continues to resonate. Most recently, Candice Carty Williams acknowledged her as in part an inspiration for her own successful 2019 novel, Queenie, which she has described as the Black Bridget. And actually that's a book that I should have brought in tonight because that is a fantastic book. Also uh, very much about female friendship and to some degree male friendship. Um, so this is a really helpful and lovely book, which sheds new interesting light on great literary friendships and there's a couple of chapters in here of books that I didn't bring in this evening such as George and Lenny from Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck which is a fantastic book um, and very much on the theme of friendship in a very deep and powerful way and also The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie which is another fantastic novel in which friendship is explored in all its passions, intricacies, and frenemies are also made and destroyed. And um, Damien was mentioning earlier today the idea of us doing a whole session on frenemies, which I think would be rather fun. But tonight we are going to focus on positive friendships because that is really far more fun for this evening and I want to be spreading positive vibes and talking about uh, great bibliotherapeutic reads which will be uplifting in this time where the world is all falling apart and we need to be really clinging on to our friendships as much as possible. However, before we move on to some of the lovely positive friendships that I want to talk about this evening. I am just going to read you a little bit from the novel Cure, in which Susan and I wrote about the idea of falling out with your best friend, which is a terrible predicament to be in. And um, there's a really lovely novel, which we 
um, use as a cure for this ailment in this book, which is an A to Z of literary remedies. So the ailment here is falling out with your best friend and the cure is So Long, See You Tomorrow by William Maxwell. We hear a lot about the pain of a failed romantic relationship, but what about the loss of a best friend of many years standing when, for whatever reason, you fall out irredeemably? Friends are meant to be forever, after all, and the pain of losing the one person in your life who has known you, perhaps from your youth, seen you at your worst and understands you inside and out, is truly gutting. Not only must you face a future without them, but you will find yourself questioning whether you are, in fact, a good friend to others and, in turn, a good person. This sorry state of affairs is captured in all its poignancy by William Maxwell in his exquisitely written novella, So Long, See You Tomorrow. Clarence Smith and Lloyd Wilson are tenant farmers on adjacent properties in rural Illinois. Marooned on the vast grasslands, the only lights that can be seen from one house are the lights of the other. And over the years, the two men come to depend on each other. When Lloyd has a sick calf, he calls Clarence before calling the vet. And when the blades of Clarence's mower jam, Lloyd hears the sputtering engine from a quarter of a mile away. And if it doesn't start up again immediately, he goes straight over. They are the only friend each other has. Fifty years on, the novel's elderly narrator, a man who grew up nearby and has an equally moving story of his own, which we won't go into here, looks back at the painful journey of Smith and Wilson and its tragic end game. There is no judgment of whether the betrayer or the betrayed, for both Smith and Wilson have their sides of the story, and Maxwell shows compassion for both points of view. What is left is a weight of sadness that the narrator still finds difficult to bear. Maxwell's slow, elegaic prose, rising up like mist from the page, takes you beyond simplistic he said, she said, to a place concerned with the ineffability of grief, the terrible fact of shattered lives. If it's not too late, do whatever you can to mend your friendship. New friends are hard to come by the older you get, and you can never replace all that shared history. If the hurt or resentment feels too great, or you cannot win your friend's forgiveness, Maxwell's deeply understanding novel will help you feel your loss and grieve and ensure that you'll never again treat a friend in a way you'll regret. So that's a bit of um, interesting advice and thoughts about falling out with your best friend in a book I wrote with my best friend, Susan Elderkin. Um, and that is actually a very beautiful story, um, So Long See You Tomorrow, which makes you really ponder the nature of friendship and what you would do to try and keep that friendship going. Now, I'm just having a look if there's any um, comments or questions. <laughs> Anne is saying that she's very jealous of the fire. Thank you, Anne. I love the fire and wish that I had one at home and I don't, so I always have to make the most of it when I come here. And it is gorgeous. And I might in a minute have to give it a bit of a puff with the bellows to keep it going because the flames are slightly dying down. Um, so, thinking about great friends in literature, one that we must mention is The, the Great Friendship in the Lord of the Rings by Meriadoc Brandybuck and Peregrine Took. There are many excellent examples of friendship in the Lord of the Rings, but I find Merry and Pippin's relationship especially interesting because unlike many of the other characters in Tolkien's series, Merry and Pippin are already friends when the story begins. While other characters form surprising friendships during their journey, such as Legolas and Gimli, Frodo and Sam, Merry and Pippin are likely friends who share an unlikely story. Of all the members of the Fellowship, Merry and Pippin have the least idea of what the journey will entail. They stumble into heroism by virtue of their loyalty and friendship to each other, to Frodo and to many others they meet along their journey. Um, so that's The Lord of the Rings, and that is a great example of a fantastic and enduring friendship. And talking of young adult novels, there's a great friendship 
um, in Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is one that really comes to mind as a poignant and evocative friendship. It's a book that if you read it, if you are um, maybe over 40, you will be taken back to times where friends were made in time, in long summer afternoons uninterrupted by any form of communication other than simply being together and this is a book about two 12 year olds who are just about to turn 13 who were both born either side of midnight and they are both drawn into a huge adventure and I want to read you the prologue of this book because it's a really fantastic read. If you haven't read it before, I'd thoroughly recommend it. Something Wicked This Way Comes, Ray Bradbury. This is quite an old version of the book. Um, and I think it was first published in 1963. And one of the reasons I love Ray Bradbury, which I'd just like to mention, is I love his writing. I think he's incredibly imaginative. But I also love his modus operandi of being a writer. It's as if he had to chain himself to a typewriter to actually get the book written. Because when he was a young writer, he was very poor and he worked in a gas station in order to make ends meet. And he had three children and he used to go to his local library and put a dime into the typewriter, which bought him one hour of writing time. And he would then manically write for an hour and then the typewriter would go ping and he wouldn't be able to write anymore and then he'd have to go back to his job the next day and continue um, with his real life but he managed to write several amazing brilliant and eternally remembered books using that method and obviously he did eventually become successful and was able to not have to change himself to a typewriter. But I think it's a great inspiration for all you writers out there to try to have some kind of equivalent of doing that so that you only give yourself a limited amount of time to write your book. Anyway, here we have Ray Bradbury, Something Wicked This Way Comes, the prologue. First of all, it was October, a rare month for boys. Not that all months aren't rare, but there be bad and good, as the pirates say. Take September, a bad month. School begins. Consider August, a good month. School hasn't begun yet. July, well, July's really fine. There's no chance in the world for school. June, no doubting it. June's best of all, for the school doors spring wide, and September's a billion years away. But you take October, take October now. School's been on a month, and you're riding easier in the rains, jogging along. you got time to think of the garbage you'll dump on old man Prickett's porch, on the hairy ape costume you'll wear to the YMCA the last night of the month. And if it's around October 20th and everything's smoky smelling and the sky orange and ash grey at twilight, it seems Halloween will never come in a fall of broomsticks and a soft flap of bed sheets around corners. But the strange, wild, dark, long year sorry, one strange, wild, dark, long year, Halloween came early. One year, Halloween came on October the 24th, three hours after midnight. At that time, James Nightshade of 97 Oak Street was 13 years, 11 months, 23 days old. Next door, William Halloway was 13 years, 11 months and 24 days old. Both touched towards 14. It almost trembled in their hands. And that was the October week when they grew up overnight and were never so young anymore. So the very beginning of the book is when the seller of lightning rods arrived just ahead of the storm. It actually takes you straight into the action. It is, I guess, a young adult novel. Um, and it is a very gripping read. It's written with Ray Bradbury's characteristic poetic language and it tells the story of these two boys 
um, Jim and William. One's dark, one's light. One's born just a minute before midnight. The other's born a minute after midnight. And they are, in a way, exact opposites of each other, which is a common trope in literary friendships. And Jim, who's the one born a minute after midnight, is drawn towards this very compelling um, fun fair that arrives three hours after midnight on the 24th of October. And he's sucked into this strange world where people seem to have bizarre magical abilities to go through, um, to go on to a revolving, um, what's it called, fun fair where you get onto a horse. He gets onto one of them and he goes round and round. Um, and every time he goes round in a circle, he loses a year of his life and he becomes a young boy. Having been about 50, he suddenly gets off the carousel and he's suddenly only 12 years old. And that happens later with uh, a woman who gets onto the carousel. She goes round and round in the opposite direction and she ends up as a very old lady. And many other strange events happen in this novel. For instance, there's an illustrated man who is deeply terrifying. And at one point, he has illustrations of the two boys which appear on his wrists, which were never there before, which is deeply disturbing. And he seems to have some strange desire to suck them into his world. But the real hero of the book is um, the father of one of the boys who is who realises that there's something afoot with this strange evil fair. Um, and he knows that the only way to combat this evil is through love and friendship. And so the fantastic, positive and uplifting vibe of the book, despite all this darkness, is that through friendship and love, they manage to conquer the evil that's going on. And I obviously won't give away the plot, but it is a really exciting and brilliant read. Thoroughly recommended. Um, another great book about friendship that I'm sure many of you know and love is The Wondrous Leonard and Hungry Paul by Ronan Hessian, which is a very beautifully quiet book. It's a book in which the two title characters are single men in their 30s. Leonard, who writes for children's encyclopedias, yearns to connect with someone and share the awe he feels at the beauty of the universe. Hungry Paul, in contrast, is more self-contained. He's considerate, fond of his family, but perfectly content with the innate orderliness of things. He is, in a way, the walking embodiment of mindfulness, living in and for the present moment. This might seem like a strange choice of a main character in the novel. And indeed, this is a very quiet and gentle novel in which no major dramas happen. But it's a really beautiful, lovely novel to read. It's also incredibly funny. Um, it is a book that really made me laugh out loud, even though it's uh, such a gentle, calm and quiet read. It actually does have quite big dramas, but their dramas are very of a very domestic nature. And I'll just read you a little bit of it so that you get a flavour of the prose and the way it's written and the nature of the, the men in the story. This is where Leonard and Hungry Paul, very near the beginning, are just having a very typical evening chatting and playing games. Hungry Paul hesitated, holding his biscuit over his tea just a fraction too long and despairing as a half moon of digestive sank to the bottom of his mug. That may be so, he said, but the trick is to know how much of the world to let in without becoming overwhelmed. The universe, as Edwin Hubble taught us, is a hostile place. Indeed, and sometimes it's difficult to know whether you want to scream or block out a scream, said Leonard. It was hard to say whether it was the Yahtzee talking, but both men had found themselves in one of those flowering conversations where one thought opens another. 
Perhaps they could have discussed the subject all evening, if only it had been hypothetical. Things being otherwise, the natural pause in the conversation gave them a moment to check themselves. Even among close friends, there are still some thoughts that ought to be allowed to ripen in private. They finished their tea and reached an unspoken decision that after a pleasant evening's play and with both their scorecards looking a mess, they would call it a night. Leonard popped his head into the sitting room to say goodbye. Helen had finished the jigsaw, Mornay's Lilies, a painting Leonard had written about in the world of art encyclopedia, and was on the phone to Hungry Paul's sister Grace, discussing wedding DJs. Peter, with saintly patience, had the TV on pause again and said goodbye with a thumbs up. Hungry Paul saw Leonard off at the door. Good night then, said Leonard. Good night, Leonard, said Hungry Paul closing his judo bathrobe at the throat to keep his chest from getting a chill. Without thinking, they both looked up at the inky universe they'd just been talking about as the big torchlight moon shone down on the snails crisscrossing the driveway. Leonard stepped over them and made his way home, carrying with him the things he had said over the course of the evening, things he hardly knew he knew. I love that idea of Leonard and Hungry Paul talking about the secrets of the universe and discovering things they hardly knew they knew. And this book is all about that quiet revelations which occur between friends. And it is a really wonderfully uplifting and thought-provoking book about friendship. It also has a very British vibe with the tea, the dunking biscuits, the game playing, the judo style dressing gown and uh, two men living at home in their 30s, not quite knowing what they're doing with their lives. It is a really lovely read, very much recommended. So before talking about my next book, I'm just going to give a very quick um attack of the fire with the bellows because it's dying down a bit and it would be nice to have some flames in the background and also it will be much warmer let's face it so, and I'm going to put on another log don't know if you Facebook people can see it there it is look at that lovely fire let me just put another log on in the hope that it will catch Okay. Excellent. There we go. So, continuing with this excellent theme of friendship, I'm now going to talk about another fantastic book, um, A Terrible Kindness by Joe Browning Rowe, which I'm sure many of you might have uh, encountered in the last few months. Chris, good to see you there, appreciating my brilliant bellows action which has definitely had the desired effect hurrah and now it's uh, nice and warm again so a terrible kindness joe browning Rowe, is a book which is to some degree based around the true story of the 1966 colliery spoil tip above the welsh village of aberfan killing 116 children and 28 adults, which is an utterly horrific, true event that really did did occur. Sorry, just lunging for a book while I'm talking. Um, and jo, this is Joe Browning Rowe's debut novel, which describes the story of a young embalmer who attends the disaster. And he is only 19. He's literally just qualified as an embalmer. And he arrives at Aberfan and has to immediately cope with embalming all these children who've been pulled from the rubble of this terrible disaster. And it is a very compassionate, beautifully written novel. Um, William Lavery, who's the hero embalmer, is, of course, deeply mentally scarred by this terrible catastrophe that occurs to him in his young life as an embalmer. He's only 19. And 
he's only just when he goes to um, help out at Aberfan, he's literally just told his girlfriend that he's in love with her, his girlfriend Gloria, and he was on the verge of a kind of beautiful blossoming relationship. But after he goes to Aberfan and has this terrible, um, awful week when he has to pull out the dead bodies of children and uh, even talk to their parents. Um, hi, Joe from Redline Books. Great to see you here, mentioning what a very special book it is. And she's saying, we met Joe, the author, who said people are more fearful of grief than death and that people are scared to look at another person's grief, which is incredibly true. And that is a book um, which is very much about grief. And Joe, I'm jealous that you've met the author, Joe Browning Rowe, who I would love to also meet and talk to her about this fantastic book, because it is very much a book all about grief. But it's also a book about friendship, as well as being about love and about being scarred by various events in his youth. So William Lavery, the hero in Barma, is not just scarred by the events of Aberfan. He's also unfortunately scarred by previous events in his youth because he lost his father very young through a terrible accident. And he then is lucky enough to go to um, a, a choir college to become a chorister. And this seems to be setting him on a new course in life. And his mother is completely obsessed with him um, succeeding as a chorister. But he has a major drama, which I won't reveal, which stops him from continuing in that path. But when he is a boy um, at the choral school, he meets and makes a fantastic friend called Martin. And his friend Martin becomes pivotal in his life. And it is a book which is as much about the friendship between those two, or that friendship is incredibly important, as it is about... Um, the terrible disaster at Aberfan. And Browning Rowe does possess the very interesting and strange, unusual credential of growing up in a crematorium and thus armed with her intimate knowledge of the death industry and also uh, getting an MA in creative writing. This does bring us a unique and redemptive exploration of the immense healing power of love care and kindness and it is actually very much a book about kindness in the same way that Leonard and Hungry Paul is also a book about kindness. Now the next book that I want to mention because I don't have the actual book here I decided to create a kind of tableau that relates to the title which is still life just showing people there on Facebook and on Instagram. So, oh, there's my still life. Oh, it says it's just paused. There we go. Um, sorry about that. Uh, that's my still life. So I'm talking about the book Still Life by Sarah Winman. And it's a book I've very recently read and absolutely loved. And it's a book which is all about friendships again and it's also about art and it's one of the books that I've recently been prescribing a lot to people very successfully because it's such an uplifting joyous book it's very much a kind of carpe diem book that makes you want to seize the day and make the most of life but also grapple your friends to you with hoops of steel because it makes you realise how important friendships are in your life. So it begins in Tuscany in 1944. As Allied troops advance and bombs fall around deserted villages, a young English soldier, Ulysses Temper, finds himself in the wine cellar of a deserted villa. There he has a chance encounter with Evelyn Skinner, 
a middle-aged art historian who's come to Italy to salvage paintings from the ruins and recall long-forgotten memories of her own youth. In each other, Ulysses and Evelyn find a kindred spirit amongst the rubble of war-torn Italy and set off on a course of events that will shape Ulysses' life for the next four decades. So it is a book in which we see a few different um, time slips, but the main events of the book are all about this wonderfully named man, Ulysses, who does a one wonderful act of kindness in which he saves a man's life. And because of that act of kindness, his life is completely changed a few years later because after he saves a man's life in Florence um, during the 1944 war, and that's when he also meets Evelyn Skinner, who has a huge effect on him, who's an art historian, he um, goes back home to London to the wife that he married, even though she doesn't she doesn't love him and she doesn't love him anymore when he comes back. And very soon afterwards, I'm not going to give too much of the plot away, he inherits a house in Florence. And I won't tell you too much about how that happens. And he then decides to go to go to Florence and he takes with him the child of his wife, who's not his child, and a great friend who's about 20 years older than him, or even more, called Cress. And Cress brings with him a parrot, and the parrot is a talking parrot who mainly talks in Shakespearean phrases. And I absolutely love the parrot, Claude, who is a really fabulous character in the book. And Joe um, from Redline Books was asking me earlier, who's my favourite character in all those novels, uh, sorry, in that novel, who's my favourite of all the friends. And it is very difficult to choose one of them because I do love them all. I love Ulysses. I love the kid who is referred to as the kid through most of the book. I also love Cress, who's the older man who brings the parrot with him, who has been sedated in order to get through the... Um, to get through the customs. So hard to choose, isn't it? But I think I've got to choose the parrot because I just love the parrot. And I love, um, there's one moment where we see into the parrot's thoughts, which doesn't happen through the rest of the book. But Claude the parrot falls asleep, dreaming of, a uh, dreaming that he's in a pink fluffy cloud and that he's nibbling the nuts that he used to love when he flew around the Amazon. And I just love that image. It's a really uplifting, beautiful, positive image. And the whole book is incredibly positive, uplifting, and totally celebrates art and makes you completely believe in the power and importance of art. And here's a quote from the book. Um, Evelyn, who is um, one of the heroes of the book, who comes and goes throughout, rhapsodizes in the early pages of the book when she first meets Ulysses. Beautiful art opens our eyes to the beauty of the world, Ulysses. It repositions our sight and judgment. So I love that idea of art repositioning our sight and judgment because that's what great art does. And I think a great book can do that too. It repositions your sight and judgment. And I actually think that that book, Still Life, did reposition my size and judgment and made me want to go to Florence and see fantastic art, ideally with a parrot. That speaks in Shakespearean phrases all the time. And you never know, it could still happen. So that's Still Life by Sarah Winman, which I would utterly recommend. And I'm pleased to say that I recommended it to a lady in Florida about a week ago. And, um, she read it and absolutely loved it and said it was perfect bibliotherapy because it was so uplifting and positive and so celebratory of friendships, which is what she felt she needed to do. So that was a joyous moment. Um, talking about groups of friends, 
we must mention The Group by Mary McCarthy, which I know is also one of Damien's favourite novels. Um, before Sex and the City and Girls, there was The Group. In fact, Candace Bushnell actually wrote Sex and the City after her editor suggested she write a modern day version of The Group. But um, this 1963 novel is a really fantastic read and I would very much urge any of you to read it because even though it's written in 1963, it's had an enormous impact on writers ever since and it is a really superb exploration of friendship. So the group details the lives of eight female friends, all from Vassar College's class of 1933, following them post-graduation. Despite their impressive liberal arts educations and their strong ambitions, all the women find themselves lacking direction. Um, the novel spans seven years, offering an expansive look into the sororal bond between these women as they navigate everything from sexism in the workplace to marriage, to child raising, to financial difficulties, to losing their virginity. Not necessarily in that order. Joe, you haven't read it yet. You've got to read it now. Um, you won't regret it. And I think you'll really enjoy comparing it to more recent books about friendship. And actually talking of um, older books about friendship as well, uh, here's one which I bet you probably know and have read, The Divine Secrets of the Yah Yah Sisterhood by Rebecca Wells, which is sweet and sad and inspiring, positive, um, was published in 1996. And this is all about a group of friends who are the Yaya Sisterhood. And they, it's all set in Louisiana and New York. And it's about a mother and daughter who have a very complex relationship, which is gradually spiraling downhill and um, they've had a massive and very public fallout because the mom is a theatre director and I can't quite remember what happens but they there's been a really terrible um, review of her play which takes umbrage with her relationship with her daughter Hang on, Susan is just saying, I read the group in the middle 70s as a young 20s girl. It was a fantastic read and I felt very grown up. And that's really great to hear, Susan. Thank you for that. And I wonder what it would be like to read again now. If you haven't reread it, maybe it would be really interesting to go back and reread it now and see how it seems to you now and whether you feel like you're revisiting your younger self because I think it's really great sometimes to go back and read a book that you read as a younger person and then through the experience of rereading the book you actually revisit the person that you were then which is a pretty fabulous thing to do because it's a way of time traveling back in time so Susan maybe I would urge you to go and read the group again and report back Tell us how you feel about it. Tell us if you still love it. Tell us if it, if it still feels fresh. And tell us if it makes you remember how you felt when you first read the book. I'd love to hear about that. So, yes, yeah, so I was talking about uh, The Divine Secrets of the Yael Sisterhood. So this is a book about, it's partly about a mother and daughter falling out. And then it's about the mother's group of friends who are the Yael Sisterhood, who are all called in to come and attempt to rescue the situation. So that's also another really great read. And it's a book that goes back and forth in time um, from now when the mother and daughter are falling out to when the Yaya sisterhood were being young mothers themselves. And one of the great things about the book is it paints a really wonderful portrayal of uh, sisters helping each other not literal sisters, friend sisters, when they're going through their kids being young and they're all kind of lying around smoking next to the swimming pool while their kids are splashing around in the pools and they're all kind of vaguely looking out for each other. 
And that's a really great read. But I'm realising that I'm going to run out of time with all these books I want to mention. So another one, which I think is a fantastic example of female friendship, is Miss Benson's Beetle by Rachel Joyce, which has a really great friendship, which is a highly unlikely friendship, when uh, Marjorie Benson, who's the heroine of the title, decides to leave her incredibly boring job working in a, in a private school that she hates. And she um, picks up, she weirdly steals the headmistress's lacrosse boots and runs off, leaving the school, and goes to search for the mysterious golden beetle that she first heard about when she was a child, which is on the other side of the world in New Caledonia. And on her way, she advertises for someone to come and help her. That's New Caledonia, by the way. And she ends up with the most unlikely travelling assistant, who's called Enid Pretty, who is all clad in bright pink, with even a pink parasol. And off they go together to New Caledonia. Enid Pretty is the last person that you'd want to have on a kind of jungle adventure, which is what they're basically going to have. But they seem initially to be a terrible pair, but then they slowly become absolutely firm and brilliant friends. And I want to just read you a tiny bit from the book because I love this passage which shows just how deep their friendship becomes and doesn't give you any spoilers either. Outside, Marguerite caught sight of her reflection in the shop window. She paused. It was the first time she'd seen what she looked like in weeks and she barely knew herself. Just as Enid had seemed smaller on the veranda, Marjorie seemed to have grown again. And not in terms of weight or width. She'd lost both these. Despite the bandages on her calves, the muscles in her legs appeared firm and strong. Enid was right. She had good legs. They'd carried her up and down the mountain and she loved them. Her shoulders were sturdy and capable. They'd borne her haversack every day without complaining. She had the look of someone she'd known about but never met. And then it occurred to her that the person she looked like was Marjorie Benson. She removed her helmet for better inspection. She took in her big yellow hair. Thank you, Enid. She stared at her bright eyes, her solid jaw, her dark round cheeks. She was not the face she'd seen reflected all those years ago in the glass cases of the Natural History Museum. Neither was she a woman with no head, but she was possibly a woman who had not held it very high until now, and she liked it. She liked how strong it was, how intelligent, how kind. She even liked her yellow hair. She wetted her palm and smoothed it round her ears. This head was not the kind of head that gave up or failed her friend. Marjorie made her way along the dirt track back to the bungalow. She would do the unthinkable. She would sell her entire collection of beetles. She would not present it to the Natural History Museum. It contained rare species. She knew that. There were private collectors who would pay good money and not be fastidious about the paperwork. She would pin every specimen and label them and get the whole collection in perfect order. She would write to the Royal Entomological Society about a buyer. Within a month, she would have enough money to get Enid away from the island. She would find a way to put her flat on the market. So even though she had believed a few hours ago she was staring catastrophe in the face, she found there was still this small space in which to hope. Far away a bird whooped, as if its insides were being scraped out with a spoon. She slowed to listen. Her blood stopped. Everything inside her stopped. It wasn't a bird, and it wasn't whooping. It was Enid. Enid was screaming. Marjorie dropped her eggs, the salt, the yams. She ran. So that is a fantastic moment from Miss Benson's people. Um, I must also mention Last Orders by Graham Swift, which won the Booker Prize in 1996. And that is a book about four friends who go to bury, sorry, scatter the ashes of their friend Jack Dodds, a London butcher. And these four men meet to carry out his peculiar last wish to have his ashes scattered into the sea. For reasons best known to himself, Jack's widow declines to join them. So 
This is on the surface a simple tale, but it all takes place over one day. And it's all about the four men and their long term friendships over the many years. I think they're all in their 60s. And it has, in a way, uh, it makes a great nod to William Faulkner's As I, As I Lay Dying, because it has a very similar kind of occasionally slightly dreamy vibe to it and also it goes from voice to voice with the different people in the book the four different men and um the daughter of jack dodds as well and his wife they all come into the book and it's called last orders because um they stop at various pubs on the way and also jack dodds was a drinker and it's about obviously the metaphorical last orders too. So this is a really great book about male friends, male older friends, and that's another fantastic read. So one that I haven't mentioned and we'll just briefly talk about is The Friends in the Secret History by Donna Tartt. And if you haven't had the pleasure of reading this book yet, I would very strongly recommend it. It's a brilliantly gripping book, which unusually for such a gripping book, does let you know that there's been a murder right near the beginning of the book and then tells you how the students in the book were led to commit that murder. Um, and it is possibly not such a loving kind of friendship uh, in literature as the other ones that we've been talking about tonight. It shows the dark underbelly of close bonds and it zeroes in on the boundarylessness and emotional brutality that can and often does exist in close friendships. So it's about a very kind of refined and sophisticated group of friends in a university where um, all of these friends are students of um, the classics and they have a very interesting professor who encourages them to go down a rather amoral route and I won't tell you too much about it but this is another kind of exploration of friends but not really a positive one because bad things happen in that book um, but it is utterly gripping and really beautifully written Sadly, I don't have time to read you a passage from it, but I was looking at it again today and marvelling over the way that Donna Tartt so brilliantly evokes what people are like. She describes them with absolutely fabulous precision and so that you can totally see them and get a sense of exactly what they're like after even one paragraph. And it's worth reading it just for that. Um, another male friendship, just to quickly mention, a prime example of strong male friendship in literature is Patrick O'Brien's maritime series, The Ionian Mission, which explores the bonds of friendship between Captain Jack Aubrey and ship surgeon Stephen Maturin, which goes on over 21 novels and they appear to be as much held together by their friendship as they are with the ongoing narrative of nautical escapades. So that's a really fabulous read as well. 21 books, so quite a big undertaking. But I know a lot of people that have absolutely loved. So many more brilliant and fantastic books that I wish I could have talked about tonight, but we've run out of time. But I'd just like to remind you... Um, it's not too late to book tickets for this Friday night, uh, Damien Barr's Literary Salon, live in Brighton. Damien's going to be interviewing Douglas Stewart, winner of the Booker Prize, um, who has just written his new book, uh, Young Mungo, which is absolutely brilliant and a fantastic read, thoroughly recommended. He wrote Shaggy Bane, for which he won the Booker Prize last year. And... You can buy tickets which are um, for going to the Ironworks in Brighton, which is very close to the station. Fantastic, lovely venue. And uh, you can book those tickets on 
Damien Barr Let's All on salon.co.uk, I believe. Um, you can find it on Facebook as well. There's also another fantastic literary salon coming up live on the 5th of May with Kit Duval in London. Um, so book your tickets for that as well. And I will be continuing with these sessions every Wednesday night doing uh, no, many of my sessions are on my at Ella Bear too. So find me on that next week. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Damien Barr's page as well in a month's time. I will probably be back at home, not with the lovely fire, sadly. But thanks so much for joining me tonight. It's been lovely to share these literary friendships with you. And I'd love to know if you have any favourite literary friendships, which I haven't mentioned or talked about this evening. And um, just to remind you, this is also a really gorgeous book by Janet Phillips, in which you can find many of the literary friendships that I've been talking about this evening. So check that out as well because it's all in beautifully presented, lovely chapters. And look what a gorgeous book it is. So thanks for coming and see you again soon. Good night. <laughs>